Leave me alone. Case of Jennifer Pan unique among others in the true crime genre is the overabundance of raw footage freely available in the public domain. There is over 11 hours of material that not only recounts her entire life in meticulous- Should I wait? Should I wait for people to come in? I, I sometimes feel like I'm being, like I'm, I'm you know, I, I start too quickly immediately after I tweeted it out. Okay, okay, here, 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 just blast it, just blast it. <sighs> no, you have VODs, man. Okay, let's just get started. Now, fuck it, I can't wait. Dude, I've been, I, I've waited for too long. I waited for three hours and 30 minutes, dude. Nobody reads your tweets, just go. This ...detail, but gives us considerable insight into her psychopathological state. Jennifer herself will narrate her own story in this video, which is the reason the following lead-up segment will be condensed, as a brief outline is all that is needed before delving into the extraordinary Wait, mind of this individual. Jennifer was born in Markham, Ontario, where she was raised with her older brother in a middle-class household. Her parents, Beek and Han, were originally from Vietnam, and their method of parenting was strict very strict, what some might even class as authoritarian. Success and achievement from their children were seen as outright obligations, whether it be in academics or extracurricular activity. And some might argue these expectations took precedence over the well-being of the children themselves. Jennifer initially took the imposed pressure in her stride and put I've everything she had into before. figure skating. She had exceptional talent and at one point was expected to compete in the Winter Olympics, but she suffered a serious knee injury at the age of 14 and was told she could no longer compete. Her dreams were cut short, but of more concern was that her parents' expectations now had to be met through the more traditional route of education. And the issue was that Jennifer wasn't anywhere near as academically gifted as she was athletic. She was averaging a C- when her parents wanted straight A's, so rather than communicate with them, she decided to meet their expectations under false pretenses and began faking her test results. This led to her faking her end-of-year report cards, which eventually led to her faking a high school diploma, and then a university acceptance letter to study pharmacology. In the Jesus abstract Christ. world of her parents, Jennifer was on her way to a noble and well-paid career in medical health care, when in reality, she was a high school dropout living with her drug dealer boyfriend, whom she had been dating in secret for almost eight years. She was eventually found out in 2010 when her parents discovered she had been living a double life and was then given an ultimatum. At 24 years old, she had to choose between one of two options. Option one was that she had to live at home under a strict regime, cease all contact with her boyfriend, and only leave the house to go back to school and pursue an education. Option two was that she could do whatever she wanted, but she would then be disowned from her family. She could never return home, and all financial support would cease immediately. Jennifer evidently decided neither option would suffice, so she created option number three. She had her boyfriend arrange a mock home invasion, where three of his acquaintances would enter the Pan household and stage a robbery gone wrong. What the two the instructions fuck? were to first ransack the home and then murder the parents. The planned date was Monday the 8th of November, with the scheduled time being roughly 11 p.m. Jennifer would unlock the front door, and three figures were caught on a neighbor's surveillance camera entering the home at 11.05. They were then seen running out just under 18 minutes later. It was at that exact time 911 received a call from the same household. Bro, what the fuck? Bro, is this person like literally the worst dispatcher in, in all of North America? Like what's happening? Like what is happening right now? Can you please spell Avenue, ma'am? She says. Oh, hey, what's going on? My parents are being murdered downstairs. Uh, 
Uh, can you please tell me how to spell Avenue? Wait, that's the calmer down? Wait, really? Oh, to keep her on the line. Beak Pan was shot twice, once in the neck and once in the head. She was killed immediately. The father, Han, was also shot twice. Never once mind. That's the best dispatcher in NA. That's actually five head. I was dumb. I was dumb. in the shoulder and once in the face. He astonishingly survived and was put into an induced coma once he arrived at the hospital. Jennifer was taken to the same hospital as a precaution, but was soon cleared of injury. She sat by her father's bedside for roughly three hours before she was taken to the Markham police station to give a statement as a witness. I want to go through a form with you. It may seem kind of, you know, why you're doing this, but um, this is a, it's, it's like you're, you're swearing to tell the truth about what you're going to talk to me about. And it's also going to explain to you the, um, the penalties for not telling the truth. I don't expect you uh, to help me, but... Bro, the thing I don't understand is like, okay, I'm going to say something here that like people might uh, find to be distasteful, but like, dude, why are murderers so extra? Like, you are you end up taking so much more initiative to deal with the problem rather than just like directly tackle it. I don't understand it. It's like, like Chris Watts, like he fucking murdered his entire family and had to like hide bodies and shit rather than just be like, I'm out. I'm done. I uh, fuck these kids. Uh, fuck you wife who's pregnant. Like I'm done. I'm going to fucking be a piece of shit. And I'm going to leave you like it just leave forehead. Like, I, why are you like, it just, I'm too lazy is what I'm trying to say. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Like I'm too fucking lazy to like plan out all this intricate shit where it's like a direct way to resolve the conflict is just by being like, dude, I lied to you guys. Like instead of telling her parents, which I mean, I don't know what the situation is like with like parents like that. But, but instead of like at some point, uh, you know, telling your family that it's top of the hour and a 60 second ad break is coming right now. And the only way to avoid that 60 second ad break is by using a VPN or ad block or potentially a Twitch prime. literally the worst one that was the word none of you guys saw that that was the worst one dude oh, that was goaded yeah if you want to avoid the ads you can subscribe with the twitch prime boys you already know what the deal is that shit's free too 399 baby <gasps> okay piece of shit <laughs> Oh my god. Okay. Here is the uh here's the ad now. Sorry. So as I was saying, okay, all jokes aside. As I was trying to describe here, like I feel like it's significantly less effort, less emotional and physical labor to directly confront a problem head on than to come up with like all of these intricate, detailed uh, solutions that literally cause so much more mental anguish and so much more physical labor as well. Feel me? Like, just fucking resolve the conflict head on, forehead. For a homicide investigation, anyone who's very close to the investigation, we do this with. Okay? So this isn't suspecting that you're not going to tell the truth. This is more of a feature that you understand the importance of telling the complete truth. 
Jennifer is not a suspect at this moment. She is only giving a voluntary statement under oath. She has not read her right to silence, but instead informed of her rights as a witness. She is basically told that fabricating evidence with the intent to mislead is an offense. After reading the notification off paper, the detective gives Jennifer a more human explanation of the instruction. What I've just explained to you is you're here voluntarily to help us that you don't have to talk to us if you don't want to, but the importance of talking to us, and if you're talking to us, the importance of telling the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, there's criminal consequences for not telling the truth. That's all that, all that stuff had to deal with. Okay. The investigator then leaves to get the commissioner of oaths, you which is saying, for the purpose of swearing of a, in the witness. But he first take, brings in a box I don't of think Kleenex. So at all. I don't... Some of these people don't even have mental illness. This is illness. universally recognized as getting startled, yet the official term in neurophysiology is the startle reflex via auditory stimulus. Hyperarousal from a traumatic event can often exaggerate this response in a manner similar to how Jennifer reacted to the sound of the door. Yo, I, I swear to God, I'm sorry for all the criminal psych majors in the chat, but like 95% of like uh, criminal psychology shit that we hear just sounds made up. And I don't mean like everything made up in the sense that like everything is technically made up, but like literally it sounds like it's made up on the spot. I don't know what it is like, okay, she got spooked, bro. That's what that is. Hello, my name is Andrew Lespiro. I'm the commissioner of oaths with York Regional Police. I'm here so you can give a truthful statement either by solemn affirmation or swearing on the Bible. Which do you prefer? Swearing on the Bible. Just put your hand on the Bible. Just saw your tweet and you're already like 15 minutes in. Maybe wait a little. Otherwise, what's the point? I don't know. I mean, you will have nowhere to go with that kind of fucking attitude. Take a week off, dumbass. We're six minutes in. That's the fucking point. You're in here now. So shut the fuck up, bitch. Nice bait, by the way. Take a week off, stupid. I literally waited too. Do you, Jennifer Pan, swear that the evidence you shall give on this investigation shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Once Jennifer is sworn in, the lead investigator returns to collect the statement. Now I want you to sort of take yourself back to earlier on today, uh, yesterday, meaning uh, the 8th of November, and uh, tell me about your day. Okay, start at any point in time where, wherever you feel comfortable, and then, then we're gonna move. We're gonna move forward. Okay. Um. Yesterday, probably around nine o'clock in the morning, nine nine thirty. Um, my mother, <coughs> she woke me up and she told me that she was going to go to visit my grandfather. Throughout the day, Jennifer explains that she practiced piano, studied piano history, talked on the phone with her friends, and had dinner with her parents. Her mother left for line dancing at 8 p.m. and returned home at about 9.30, at which time Jennifer was alone in her room watching TV, ready to go to sleep. And then, suddenly I just heard my mom calling for my dad to come down, and that's when I lowered the volume on my TV, and I could hear the voices weren't any voices I was very familiar with. And so I was scared and I couldn't move. I just sat in my room for a while. And then I thought I heard them all let, like leave the top floor and I peered out of my bedroom door. And a guy was there and he came at me and had string in his hands and tied my arms back and said, I have a gun behind your back. Do what I say. If you do what I say, then no one will get hurt. Where is the money? Show me where your money is. My mom kept trying to get up and they kept telling her to sit down. And so I didn't want her to get hurt. So I told her, mom, sit down. They were trying to find her wallet, but she, her English isn't good, so she kept saying first. They kept pushing her down onto the chair. Okay. Okay. Take your time. It, it feels like, dude, she's fucking so good, dude. This is terrifying. This is like actually fucking terrifying. She is so good at this, dude. Like, obviously she rehearsed this. Like she actually bad? What, what do you mean actually bad? Bro, she's literally like, it's clear that she rehearsed this and is actually good at this. Take your time. 
All this is very important, so take your time. Jennifer's nonverbal communication up to this point has made sense, and the reflection of her mother's last moments seems to push her over the edge. It could be assumed the detective still considers Jennifer a victim at this moment, but in the next moment, he will start becoming suspicious. They kept all the lights off on the main floor. The only time there was light oh, was when no. they opened the fridge door to see if they could find where my mom's purse was. Take yourself back to a moment in your life when you have been... Why the fuck would you know that, dude? That's so specific. Oh, no. ...overwhelmingly upset about something. And at I mean, the same oh, no, time, no, no. we're why trying to explain this, like, to I'm someone why you were upset. You wouldn't quietly oh, and yes. reservedly convey the events. You would likely blurt them out in a forceful and disordered manner. Your sole focus would be on processing your thoughts and conveying them into speech. The emotional turbulence of severe hysteria and grief makes it very difficult to convey thought into actual dialogue, and the simple wording of a sentence becomes very challenging. Jennifer seems to be more concentrated on how she's being perceived, yet finds her words easily and executes her sentences perfectly. One of the, the gentlemen asked my father if he had money in his wallet and where his wallet gentlemen. was. Gentlemen. So they took me, because I was next to the stairwell, they took me up the stairs to sh show them where my father's wallet was, but I'm, I didn't know. They had turned the room upside down. I didn't know where his pants were at that time. The intruders in retrieve $1,100 from the master bedroom and then tie Jennifer to the upstairs banister. Next thing I know, I think I hear my parents going down the stairs and my mom was asking them for me to come with them. They wouldn't let me come with them. And after they said, the last thing I heard them say was, you lied, you lied to us, you lied to us. And then I heard two pops. My mom screamed. I yelled out for her. And a couple more pops. Take your time. Take your time. And I think I heard my mom say, or moan or something and then they did one more before they left and then one of the guys said we have to go now it's been too long and then they why is your the chat door. sagging this bitch because and chat will say anything dude once they were out the door I heard my dad go up the stairs and at that point Jennifer has clearly gotten her story straight beforehand yet in the next moment appears to realize how unusual it is that she was able to make a phone call when her hands were tied behind her back to a banister she hesitates stutters and even looks to the detective for approval twice before she quickly moves on I had my phone in my po in my on me behind me that I had hidden there that they didn't know about so I had my phone in my po in my on me behind me that I had hidden there that they did. Bro, see, no matter how fucking smart you are, and this is one of the smartest murderers we've seen so far. You still fucking you still have holes, dude. These guys can't. These guys can't ever fucking put together like a full blown. What do you mean? No, she's smart as fuck, dude. She's clearly very very smart. Would you murder better than her? Fuck no, I'm an idiot, dude. I didn't know about. So when I when I when they when I thought that they had heard them all leave. Dumbass is in the chat. She was a C minus student. She faked her grades. Yeah, dude, I know. Grades are the best indication that someone is smart or fucking stupid. Like, wh wh whose chat are we in right now? Like, what what the fuck? I feel like a POS is killing bugs if what? Leave and my dad ran up the stairs. I whipped up the phone and I called 911. Bro, she was able to dupe two adult human beings that gave birth to her for years. Make them lead them to believe that she literally got fucking all A's in high school and then got accepted into college. If you don't think that as a teenager, being able to be crafty enough to be able to put that together 
is not a demonstration of intellect, like some kind of intelligence, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you're crazy. Like, you're wild. Like, that is, that's like charisma. She just beefed up all of her fucking persuasion skills. But I, I still hadn't heard anything from my mom, and all I could hear was my dad running on the street. She's 24, but your point stands? No, motherfucker, she wasn't 24 when she was lying about her fucking high school grades, though. It's not hard to fake things? Yeah, okay, dude. Well, you can't even fake not being a fucking idiot in my chat. Moaning sounds. The detective then breaks the event down into components and has Jennifer go through each moment in more detail. The first of which is the appearance of the intruders. Jennifer now describes the one who appeared to be in charge. The only thing I can remember was him was he had dreadlocks. He had dreadlocks. So are you, uh, it, can you describe his race to me? He was black. Did it, was his head covered? Was his face covered? Do you remember anything about that? Just that his dreadlocks were like, kind of like, flopping all over the place. I couldn't really see his face and they kept the lights dark as much as as much as possible. Did he have a gun? Yes. Did you see the gun? I only saw the top part of the gun. What did it look like? Um kind of it was black. Yeah. Do you know where the other guys involved in this are? I know one stayed with my parents. Wait, Chad's getting mad that she said the dudes were black? I mean they were black. She got her boyfriend to hire black dudes to do this. And so was the gun. Downstairs. Okay. Um, the other one, I'm not, at that point in time, I was more focused on him. Like, he was seeing me and he was coming after me. So you're so saying there's three for sure? Yeah. That's all, you saw a total of three at one time, you saw three people yes. together? Yes, when I went downstairs, okay. I saw three shadows. She details the appearances of the other two assailants, whom she asserts were also black males. The detective then brings her back to the one in charge. Now the first guy, who spoke to you, what kind of, did he have any accent? None Is it clear? that I could make out. Was it clear English? English. Unbroken? Unbroken. No accent? From the terms he used, I didn't get to pick up an accent, no. He used so short phrases. He sounded, he sounded Canadian? I would say, yes, he was born here. He was born here. She asserts that the second intruder didn't speak, while the third had a Caribbean accent. She then goes on to say she was taken downstairs for a brief moment and saw her parents under guard in the living room. Her father was asked where his wallet was, and he told them it was in the master bedroom. Jennifer was then taken back upstairs alone with two of the assailants to help them find it. They don't find the wallet, but instead retrieve a pile of cash from inside the nightstand. Jennifer was then tied to the upstairs banister and left alone as the intruders went back down. And the next thing I can hear are them telling my parents to move to the basement. Okay. And I'm asking them, why, where are you going? And my mom's yelling to me, I want my daughter. Why can't my daughter come too? I want my daughter. Jennifer then hears one of the intruders yell, you lied to us. Who do you hear yelling you lied to us or to Number that extent? Number three. Number three. To my, I'm assuming it's to my father because he was the one asking for the wallet. Now you hear this commotion downstairs. You said you heard two pops and you heard who scream? My mom. Your mom. And what was she screaming? Do you I remember? Make it out. It yeah. was kind of like a cry, cry yell, so it was just... Okay. They had made the first round, or pop, pop, and they, has, they had said, okay, that's enough. Let's go. Who said that? Whose voice is that? Number one. Okay. And then I heard one more after that, and they were like, that's enough. Let's go. Okay. Yo, why does she go from fucking crying and being in tears to like accurately retelling every fucking moment that occurred with in great detail with no emotion whatsoever. I mean, I know why, because she fucking did it, but like, that would be suspicious. That'd be a sussy baka move. And again, that's number one. Yes. So what do you hear next? After you hear the scrambling, they're gone. 
because you're hearing no more. I gather that's how you assume they're gone is because you don't hear it. Then you hear your dad. I, I reach for my phone at okay. that point. And you call 911, okay? When your father exits, you hear the door open because you hear your dog, and then you And then I can hear, like, the outside noises. Okay. Like the wind coming in, and I just hear my dad, uh, I think he's... You think that he's sustained some kind of injury because he's not, you can't understand what he's saying. Okay. What about, do you, do you, can you hear your mom? Okay. Where does your dad go? Do you know where, you never see your dad again until when we're at the hospital. I think that's what you said, right? I saw him when he was on the gurney. Is there any reason? I'm not going to even click on that link. I'm just going to ban you for a day. Reason to suspect or anything that's happened in the recent weeks leading up that would have you guys be a target of some type of incident like this? We live a straightforward, kind of almost routine life. Whenever Jennifer smiles, it takes her a couple seconds to realize she's not exhibiting the correct behavior, and she then snaps back into her solemn stare. The two looks are so diametrically opposed to each other that it becomes glaringly obvious she's forcing one of the emotions. What, in your opinion, would cause people to target your house to think that there was a large quantity of money? I'm not sure. Now, you say your mom drives uh, a Oh. This is a part of the plan where you didn't really, doesn't really make sense. Home evasions of this magnitude with like three fucking assailants. That's not exactly commonplace. That shit's not happening all the goddamn time. That does happen. Uh, if you have a stash house, for example, and people know that you have a stash house. So you have a lot of cash in your house. That's usually the only, uh, that's usually why this kind of, three person like home invasions would ever occur okay because are you a cop now no motherfucker i have a brain why the fuck why i i joke about this all the time whenever people say like oh my god i need an ar-15 to save my family to defend my family from what a death squad what do you have in your family that would warrant what do you have in your house that would warrant like multiple assailants coming in and trying to fucking steal from you Okay, hindsight Andy, no, this is something I talk about all the fucking time. This is something that I have talked about numerous times when I discuss like the necessity for an AR-15, which is uh, a, a better, which is a better gun to take down multiple assailants. But again, C grade Rutgers student has criminal studies degree now. Wait, what? First of all, criminal studies, I fucking graduated with honors uh, with a poli sci degree. So I don't know what you're talking about. Criminal studies is like literally regarded as like a lesser degree than poli sci. And also I graduated with a three, seven, five. So suck my cock. And even then it doesn't even matter. Not necessarily per se, but more guaranteed to drop someone than a handgun. No. Okay. Okay. Stop focusing on the AR 15 line there. The point is I've talked about this before. Like, Home invasions do occur, okay? But oftentimes it's not going to be fucking... Um, uh, oftentimes it's not going to be unless like... Because that's a gigantic risk. Walking into someone's house with guns is a huge risk. They might have a fucking gun. No matter where you live, they might have a gun. They might be able to fucking defend themselves. So, in most circumstances, it's got to be fucking worth it. And it's not worth it to just like hit up a fucking random dude's house. You know what I'm saying? It's Alexis. It could be because of the aesthetics, yes. What about your dad? He drives a Mercedes and he loves that baby. Is that right? The he questions that, end here, and the detective leaves the room for half an hour to double check if he needs any more information. After 15 minutes of Jennifer waiting alone, we're gifted with another performance of the startle reflex, only this time it's slightly less convincing. I've been here longer than my last relationship. Three months? 
If investigators were certain of Jennifer's innocence, this would have been the first and last time she would have been questioned in such a manner. Police are extremely careful in how they involve victims in investigations as to not cause further unnecessary trauma. But on this particular occasion, it would come as no surprise that Jennifer's psychological well-being was of less concern. She was officially still a victim and witness, but unofficially a leading suspect. She was called back in to give another statement just two days later at 9 a.m. She was told the reason was to collect more details, but you'll notice that the line of questioning and the answers they attain have little to no use for anything outside of Jennifer's culpability. The actual reason for this second statement is to collect further information to use against her at a later stage. In this interview alone, they already start the process of cross-examination and start to catch her out in previous lies. Jennifer is still a witness at this moment, and the exchange is void of any direct confrontation. Yet she is still put under a modest amount of pressure, and the holes in her story start to become ever more apparent. Take that first interview that we had, which was, you know, hours after what, what had transpired, put it aside. It's almost like we've never spoken before. Okay? Uh-oh. So we're starting afresh. We're starting from new. Oh, shit. That way you're not going to say, I think I already told him that. Don't Time worry to about what you've already camp, told dude. Do you, Jennifer Penn, uh. swear or declare that the evidence that you give in this investigation shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. We're going to see if we've learned or if you've remembered anything else and there's some questions with respect to that uh, statement that I'm going to ask you about, okay? So, but I'm going to let you start again, and, and let's, let's move forward from any time in that day where you want to start. If it's the time you woke up or if it's the time that your first interaction, it's your choice. Okay, I'm just, I'm very nervous, and I why are you, let's, why are you Why are you nervous? Tell me about why you're nervous. Because I don't want to say the wrong thing. All, so, because that day was... A lot. You're right. And I've been scattered, and so bits and pieces are here, and some pieces aren't here, and I'm just... So, I want you to sit back in your chair, okay? Just sit back in your chair, take a deep breath, okay? Close your eyes. Just follow my line. Just sit back in the chair for a second. Sit back. Relax it's the best you can. Close your eyes. And just breathe for a minute, okay? The most curious detail you've probably come to notice is this. It's known as a self-pacifying gesture. A person who does this is most often uncomfortable and sometimes fearful of what lies ahead. It's a coping mechanism to dissipate stress and afford self-assurance. What I can remember is when I woke up, had some breakfast. She practices on the piano, studies piano history, plays games on her phone, and speaks with her friends on Facebook during the morning hours. Her mom leaves to visit her grandfather at around noon and returns at 3 p.m. to prepare dinner. Her father comes home at around 4.30 from work, and dinner is served one hour later. Her mother leaves for line dancing at 7, then returns at 9.30. Jennifer at this point is in bed talking with her friend on the phone, and her father is in the computer room. She then hears her mother loudly call out to her father. What is she saying? She's calling him by his name and to come down. Okay, does, so give us verbatim what do you hear her saying? In Vietnamese. She's like, Hanoi. I do this with my hands all the time. She's clearly aware that she has to appear mournful over the subject matter and sensibly draws out this. Sure fucking seems like neurodivergent witnesses are absolutely fucked if they're questioned. Uh, probably. Yeah. I mean, welcome to the world where everyone is fucking able as to shit. I mean, dude, think about it this way. Think about it this way. I mean, neurodivergent people get fucking framed for murder. <laughs> like, when they haven't done the thing. Like, that literally happens. <laughs> ...emotion at the correct moments. Yeah, Yet watch what's how to fascinating make a is how she's unable to maintain this emotion when inquired over the same elements. 
In this very moment, she appears completely grief-stricken, but when the investigator inquires further, this supposed grief rapidly dissipates. It's extremely difficult to convincingly act out an emotion while evaluating a question. It requires two completely different parts of the brain, which is why most people can only do one of these things at a time. This is exactly what you see in the next moment, a murderer, and continuously how to make throughout murderer, this interview. And what does that translate to? Uh, that's my father's name, Han. Uh, come down here. Does she say anything else associated with that? With that? I can't hear clearly because, like, I was on the phone and the TV was on. Sure. But that's what I heard. Is she yelling, or is it? Uh, Neurodivergent means you have like uh, a a neurological disorder, like you have a disability. Okay, you're you're neuroatypical. Disabled, motherfucker. Disabled. I, I don't know how else to use it. Like, uh, it's like the most. Uh, it's the most, like, uh, appropriate way of saying, uh, like, you're different than what would be otherwise, like, considered, uh, uh normal. Like, ADHD, OCD, Asperger's, that sort of thing. Neuroatypical doesn't equal disabled, what the fuck? Doesn't neurodivergence mean like you're neuroatypical and also uh, you have some kind of uh, disability, a neurological disability? Being neurodivergent isn't a disability. How fucking neurotypical of you? You can be neurodivergent if you're from a different culture. Wait, what? Bro, we are describing a concept to people who do not have any sort of contextual understanding. You are yelling at me for using a different term to describe something to someone who just simply does not understand it. Okay? A person who asks, what is neurodivergent? Uh, is going, is, I'm trying to fucking describe it to them in the way that they will understand if they've never heard what this is. Neurodiversion refers to an individual who has less typical cognitive variations such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Neurotypical refers to individuals with typical development. Neuroatypical is what I said. Uh, and intelligent cognitive functioning. ASD chatter here using disabled is actually preferred to words like special. You are neurodivergent having ADHD and I'm also neurodivergent having autism. It's a spectrum of abilities and development. They're full of shit. Neurodivergent literally means disabled slash mentally ill. Mentally disabled equals neurodivergent, but not neurodivergent equals mentally disabled. What? Dude, you're making it more confusing. You're literally making it more confusing. For people who don't understand neurodivergent, it just means that you have some kind of, uh, of, of like mental disability, okay? But it's a varying degree. It's like a fucking big window, okay? I'm fucking neurodivergent. Okay? Because I have ADHD. That's just like... Alright? That's how it is. God damn, bro. Shut up, everybody, about like idiotic fucking semantic shit, okay? Oh my god. Now motherfuckers are gonna be like, Hassan, you're literally being ableist because I can't help myself from fucking parsing through every fucking semantic uh, difference here. And you are being di you are being ableist by not letting me fucking uh, uh, make a larger argument about a semantic difference that is otherwise not important. Shut the fuck up. Yes, I'm ableist. Yes, I am also uh, neurodivergent. Yes, we exist. Shut the fuck up. It's a loud, it's a, she's not yelling, but it's a loud tone. Okay. She then hangs up the phone with her friend once she hears the commotion. As I'm hanging up the phone with him, I hear footsteps going up the stairs. Okay. But they're not... They're heavier footsteps than what is to be expected from my parents. Okay. Jennifer hears unfamiliar voices, so she opens her door to investigate. She has spoken for two minutes up to this point without being interrupted, and once again manages to build up her emotion to correlate with a supposedly terrifying event. Yet as soon as the detective interjects with a question, we once again see this emotion <coughs> dissipate. I peered out, and there was a person 
in the my what would have been my brother's room. And where's your brother's room located? Uh, just a little bit down the like I could see my from my doorway to his doorway, just okay. a little bit down the hall. Okay. The first intruder then robs Jennifer at gunpoint before taking her to the ground floor, where she then sees her parents sitting next to each other. From where I was standing, my father was sitting on the right, and my mother was sitting on the left. Sitting where? On a couch, on our couch. Sitting on the couch. Are they looking out towards you? No, their backs are towards me. Okay. And you're now on the ground level? Are you on the floor? Or on the I'm sitting, sitting on the, on the floor. I'm sitting on the floor. All right, where are your hands? They had tied my hands, so let's as go, I said. Let's go back up to uh -oh. the stairs. Remember we said... Yo, notice how... Notice how the dude is no longer questioning with, like, kitty gloves. Uh, I, I feel like he's he's being... He's, he's sussing her out a little bit. He's like, you're being a sussy little baka right now, and... Uh, Saying. Her emotional display in seeing her parents in distress gradually faded after each interjection. But you'll now see it completely cease altogether once she realizes that she made her first mistake. Everything she had said up to this point correlated with her initial statement, but she had just forgot to mention that she was first tied up before being taken downstairs, and only brought it up when reminded by the detective. Take the other statement and whatever we've said before. No, I, I said it earlier. She didn't say she was tied up earlier. She completely forgot to mention it and seems to be trying to convince the detective otherwise. It's a moment of slight panic, which becomes far more pronounced when you compare it to her supposed grief-stricken recollection five seconds earlier. The detective the detective doesn't challenge this, as it can be used against her at a much later stage, and the main objective at this point is to collect as much conflicting information as possible. Okay, then we must, let's, let's get back to that area, I think you might have touched on it, we went back into the description. So where does you, where do you get your hands uh -oh. tied and where does the string come from? I'm not sure where the string comes from, but he had the string. Okay. And he, after I gave him my money, that's when he tied my hands. She is then taken downstairs where she sees her mother being interrogated by the second assailant over the whereabouts of the cash. According to her first statement, the second assailant never said a word the entire time. He had pushed her back onto the couch and she Who kept pushed her? Number two. Okay. He was pushing her back onto the couch. And she she kept saying, Where's my purse? Where's my purse? And the guy kept telling her to sit down and I didn't want my mom to get hurt. I don't know if this is fucked up or not. <coughs> I don't know if this is fucked up How or not, but I literally feel like being a get... detective is kind of like playing Among Us. But with like real stakes. Like the more I watch it, the more I'm like, this is like, you have to have full, you have to have a, a, a comprehensive understanding of, of, of like all of the events that took place. You have to analyze the scenery. You, you have to literally fucking catch people uh, in... Uh, contradicting stories, shit like that. I mean, Among Us is a lot like being a detective. Sorry. Push back down. I'd say she got up twice. Has number two uttered a word at this point in time? I can't remember hearing him. Okay. So we're just correcting what you said earlier because you said earlier that it was number two who was asking where the purse is, what are the purse is, and now you've said now it's number one guy who would I'm initially. Sorry, it's just... No, no, no. It's all a purpose. Uh, the purpose here is clarifying what you're saying. So number I one just is don't wanna... number one is the one who's doing the talking about the purse. Number three is focused on your dad's wallet. Okay. Jennifer continues to make contradictions and is forced to correct herself multiple times after she notices the puzzled gaze from the detective. He inquires over the appearance of assailant number two, who is wearing a hoodie according to the first statement. Do you get a good look at number two now of what he's wearing? All I could tell was he had a vest and his face was like a long oval face. He had a vest? No, hoodie. Okay. A uh, dark hoodie. Okay. Did, did you see them recover anything inside your mom and dad's room? I did not see anything, no. Are you sure? Because uh, we would, when we spoke the last time, there was some mention of some other money that went missing. I believe when they were looking for my father's wallet, they had 
opened the drawer, and there was a, it was in an envelope. What drawer would that have been in? On my, on the, if you're in, at the door where I was standing on the left side, the bedside table. Whose side of the bed is it? That's my mother's side of the bed. Okay. More than likely a total coincidence, yet she almost appears to be praying that she gave the correct response. Fortunately for her, she was correct on this occasion. And approximately how much money? I'm not sure how much she took out for our our trip. <coughs> but I can, o I can only estimate about a few hundred dollars. A few hundred, because at the time, the last time or you told me, you were pretty out of $1,100. So I'm curious to know how you came up with that number. You are being such a sussy little baka. I believe is when we were at the border we, and we stopped at the duty-free, my mother was deciding whether to use her U.S. currency or her, uh, her U.S. currency or her Canadian currency. So it was at that time you remember hearing $1,100? And that's what, is that the inference you're saying? Is that, because you're pretty solid saying that it was $1,100 that went missing, that was, was taken, and that you saw it when we spoke. And who took it? Who took possession of the money? I'm sorry. It's, it's all right. The detective lets the contradiction slide once more. Jennifer is then brought to the moment where the intruders had just left and she is tired. No matter how fucking skilled you are, no matter how much you think this shit through, clearly it still falls apart, dude. Okay? You're just never, you're, you're never well prepared enough to, to obviously get away with, you know, hiring a hitman to murder your parents. That's what we're learning today. That's what I'm learning, at least, from this story. That's the moral of this story. Hide to the upstairs banister. Let's come back to now. You're being taken to the, the banister in the upper room. Don't apologize, okay? I'm going to try and ask you questions to try and clarify points. Yeah, okay. Okay, if you don't remember, you don't remember. Okay, so don't, there's no apologizing. The only reason you would apologize to me is if you've lied to me. No. Okay, no, so just, just, then in this case, then don't apologize to me. It's okay. Okay, I'm going to ask you questions to clarify points. Okay. You're now bound to this, to the, to the railing. Can you show me, can you stand up and turn around and tell me, just show on the camera, how your hands are bound and how you are against the railing. You don't have to sit down. I just need to see how you were. Telling. The only reason that I'm trying to, I, I need to do this, is that I'm also going to ask you, is that it, so take this back to, from, take it out of a traumatizing event, which it is, and put, put yourself into a more clinical position, because I want to see how you could physically get your phone out of your waistband. We're obviously going to need to know that. It's very important. So, traumatize a wide way, now put yourself into a, just a I once convinced my parents that there were no parent-teacher meetings for like half a year before they caught on. That's my claim to fame. Wow, dude. You're just like Jennifer who murdered her parents. Pretty sick, dude. Good job. <laughs> the state of, I need to man mechanically show how I can get access to my phone. Okay, because that's obviously very relevant. I, we know you made the phone call, but questions are going to obviously raise is that if my hands are bound and I'm against the railing, how do I talk to a 911 operator? True. I mean, okay. that's the so dumbest clinically, too. That's like the easiest way to get caught. What a fucking... Just stand up, focus in on how you okay, did thanks. it. And I want you to stick that in your waistband as an example. Okay, so take your, just take your sweat off, because this will be a very smooth, very quick thing. It's a one-time demonstration. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it. The two critical parts of this demonstration are where Jennifer states she was tied and the movement of her arms as she takes her phone out of her pocket. The investigator is hoping the mechanics uh -oh. of the two components would be illogical and contradict each other. I tied my upper arm. Yes. Around the banister. Yes. But my hands were bound together. So your hands are bound together, so and this time. is the arm that's the, the strings wrapped around against the banister. She had, like, she had a couple days to literally practice this physically, by the way. And if she hasn't, that's, like, terrible. Oh, thanks, Mom. Banister? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now how can you get to the phone? 
And how do you make the phone call? Whether it be a stroke of luck or that Jennifer had prepared for this moment, this actually made sense. Had her arms gone left or the point oh, of restraint shit, been below the elbow, none of this would have been possible. It's perhaps the single moment where Jennifer's statement was somewhat beneficial to her defense. We know Jennifer was tied up when police arrived, but the assumption was that she had her phone in her hands the entire time and wouldn't have had to retrieve it from her waistband. She can now argue that this portion of her testimony is genuine. 911. Mm-hmm. And do you talk down like that? Yes, I'm yelling at the phone like this. And how can you hear? I turned the volume on max. Yes. So that's exactly the way that you're talking to her against the railing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good enough. Sit down. Jennifer is then brought back to the moment just before she heard the gunshots. At this point, I started hearing my parents get up. And they're moving. And my mom's yelling, where's my daughter? I want my daughter. Where's my daughter? And I'm yelling, Mom, I'm here. Here. Jennifer, take a Kleenex and, and just take a minute. You'll notice that she doesn't wipe her eyes or blow her nose, just buries her face in the tissue, which the detective later testified remained completely dry. What the fuck? They look at that. These guys are demons, bro. You just can't, you can't out, you can't out shark these motherfuckers. Who checks the Kleenex, dude? Are there nose dookies in there? <clears throat> what was he going in to see? Like how they would taste or something? I don't understand. We okay. check the Kleenex. So we're now down in the basement. They're down in the, you know your parents are down in the basement. I heard pop. And then my mom. I heard her squeal. Multiple pops occur thereafter before she hears the intruders leave through the front door. Once the door closed, I heard my father. He ran up the stairs and all I could hear was moaning. Yeah. Once I heard him starting to move, I that's when I pulled out the phone and I was trying to call 911. This is untrue. She only realized her father was alive midway through the 911 call. And in that exact moment, you can actually hear genuine fear in her voice compared to her fabricated panic the moment before. The final part of this statement is collecting information to set up the main strategy for Jennifer's interrogation that will take place 10 days later. They go through Jennifer's past and gather intel to lay the foundation for what's known as the how and why solution, which will be explained in further detail at a later stage. What I want to do now is I want to go into your past, okay? And start talking about Dude, I'm sorry. It's, they're doing that thing again where it's like, well, this is called the how and why solution. Oh, you mean like fucking building motive, dude? That's crazy. I, I didn't realize there was a specific name for, for motive. No, it's called the how and why solution. Things that have been going on with you. The detective now morphs into a therapist, and what's fascinating is how Jennifer doesn't once question the new line of inquisition. Many argue that it was the first time Jennifer was even asked about such matters, giving reason for her willingness to open up. This may have been the first time in her life she was able to process her frustrations and vent to someone who appeared to care. The first topic is her parents, and the expectations and pressures she was under to succeed, which led to her faking her grades and then her college degree as to not be a disappointment. How did you feel about that? How did you feel about having to lie to your parents? Oh my god, that's guilty, the biggest self-report, dude. Bring it up. There was just so much... so much expectation. Did you have any resentment towards them for this? I chose what I chose. Um, but in the end, I chose my family. Guys. This is a little known technique called the asking questions solution, where the detective will ask questions to get answers out of her. 
She just referred to the ultimatum she was given by her father. The choice to live at home and go back to school, or be completely cut off by her parents and live with her boyfriend. Information gathering on Jennifer's past goes on for roughly two hours and twenty minutes. The detective then ends the exchange by putting her under some pressure. It's not a direct confrontation, but it's by far the most uncomfortable position she's been in up to this point. The detective subtly switches back to the home invasion and how the intruders were able to gain access without breaking in. Like you didn't hear, you didn't hear a doorbell, you didn't hear a door knock, you didn't hear a door kicked in, you didn't. I hear... was, I said I was watching no, TV on the phone. I, I don't know how. Yeah, I, I, I know. We went over that back and back and forth. We don't know how. Uh oh. So, somehow they got into your house by getting through your mom down on the lower level, right? Because she's the only one who's down she's there. She's the only one down there. So. Bro, have you never watched a fucking crime uh, movie? Like, that's literally the first thing that detectives look at is like, no sign of forced entry. It seems the suspects knew the victim. Like, you know what I mean? That's like straight up some CSI 101 shit, dude. It's very confusing. Generally, random events are not, in most cases, random. There's a rhyme or reason why they've come to your house. Yep. But from what you've told me inside the house, the only thing that you hear them saying to you is they're looking for money. Yep. And they're you don't do a fucking a armed robbery like that for no reason. So you're telling me that you, you had no involvement in what happened meaning not saying how the outcome came, but you you had no involvement in, in any type of illegal activity that would have drawn you or the attention of you to have bad people come to your house looking for large sums of money. You're not involved in this any which way. Because the question obviously stands, Jennifer, is you're upstairs and they're downstairs. No. Right? So it's a natural concern when, why would they leave you alone? Why would they not do the same to you? Yeah, why wouldn't they murder her? Why would they know there's a fucking money in the house? Like, wh who has cash in their fucking house, dude? The real question is, why don't you have a lawyer, dog? Lawyer up. I mean, fuck, I don't know why I... I I am not siding with the murderer here, okay? I'm just simply stating that, like... <laughs> I'm not defending her. <laughs> Look at my lawyer dog, he's invisible, I'm going to jail! You can't answer that question? The only thing I can say is he said I cooperated. The, but I asked him to take me. The number one guy? Mom. The number one guy said you cooperated? Okay, who's to say this whole thing isn't a lie? That what you're telling me is a lie? Because if you are lying, it's the most cold-blooded thing that I've ever oh faced God. in my life. <laughs> God damn, he said it. Like you ever hear you ever read this manga called Death Note? There is nothing that you've said to me today is a lie. Now back to another very difficult question. But if I don't ask it, I'm gonna be you, it's an obvious one. The resentment that you had that you may have had towards your parents for the interference in your relationship and your life and essentially locking you down in your house. At the end of the day, I love my parents, and I chose to be with them. And if I wanted to, I could have just left, but I didn't. I wanted to stay with them and take care of them. What? Why? So this wasn't some evil plot that you thought up to... Bro. That's not even something you would say. You'd be like, what are you fucking talking about? Like, I lo It doesn't matter that I resent my family for fucking being restrictive like everyone's parents are fucking restrictive in some way i still love them that's what you would say if you're a fucking innocent person not like i chose to stay with them that is way too much of a fucking hyper rational and hyper logical fucking response to someone being like did you murder your parents
that's a ginormous red flag in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but like I I I chose to stay with them is a fucking is like a very weird uh thing to do. Are the parents also at fault in this case? No, dude, no. Bad parenting uh unless like bad parenting literally means like child abuse and like physically trying to murder your child and then in self-defense your child murders you outside of that like no the parents aren't fucking at fault for being murdered by their daughter a murder you're crazy chatter you fucking sick freak oh my god no Okay, no interaction. Everybody needs to no. calm the fuck down. Everyone who keeps saying she's hot, like, dude, just keep it to yourself, okay? You didn't have anything to do with this thing at all, whatsoever. No. You don't engage in illegal activity. It's a murder, murder. Because you know that it'll be very easy. It, it will be a very easy thing to discredit you on, right? We're we're in the process of trying to add credibility to what you tell us, and that's through the process of asking people and doing whatever. Through that same process, it will be very easy to find the flaws in what you've said, which again then turns the focus back to you. Okay. I don't. It's a natural progress. It's a natural thing that investigators do. We eliminate people, or we draw our attention to them. It's a natural uh, thing. It's a, it's not brain surgery. Okay. The detective leaves the room for 20 minutes to allow Jennifer to stew in her own thoughts before they end the statement. He comes back to add one last bit of psychological pressure that he carefully disguises as reassurance. Jennifer will leave terrified, but still believe the police are on her side. Okay, we're, we're, we're done, essentially. <sighs> How are you feeling? Yeah, sorry, you should really scare me. Did I? What did I scare you about? Sit down, sit down and, and t take a load off. Tell me how, tell me how you're feeling. And how I scared you. I don't want you walking away from here thinking I'm evil. I want you to walking around from here thinking that this guy is helping investigate my mom's murder and he's going to turn over every stone possible to make sure that we catch the people who do that. That's what I want you feeling. So I don't want you walking away from here thinking that I'm a, I'm, I scared you or I'm, I'm a bad man. Sometimes we have to ask very, very difficult questions, but it's my job. Okay. You're our only link. You're it. Until your dad regains, he is back and being able to be be, be spoken to. Right oh, now, you're shit. our only link to this case. Bro, dad survived it? Oh my god. Oh, she done fucked up, dude. That's crazy. Plot twist. I survived, bitch. Her father had bullet fragments lodged in his face that doctors couldn't remove, and a shattered neck bone. At the time of this interview, the consensus was that if he did regain consciousness, he would be useless as a witness due to irreversible brain damage. So we're, we may rely on you heavily on, until we can speak to your father. God damn it, okay? dude. So don't be afraid. If you've told the truth, the last thing you should be afraid of is, is anything. If you've told the truth and you've been truthful through this whole process, then you're helping. Your God. You're doing your part. Okay? And don't be afraid of me. I'm just afraid because, you know, like, I know everything is just all pointing negatively right now, and I, I don't understand why. I'm just, I feel that, like, the way you're, you're speaking to me, it's kind of like, I know you said that you had to say those things, but it's, yeah. it's here, and I've already said it to the special victims yesterday, but there's like ideas in my head. Yeah. And I'm afraid to say it out loud, but... Ideas about speculation of what happened, or how it happened. Unfortunately, uh, at uh. times some of us have to point the finger, seem like we're pointing the finger, and it really is just to provoke you to see what you're going to do, how you're going to respond. Okay? So... It's only a question, and it ha it's been answered, and if you've been truthful, Okay, you have nothing to fear, absolutely nothing. Okay. Police kept Jennifer under close observation from this point forward. A surveillance detail was assigned to track her every movement, and she was even monitored at her mother's funeral three days later. 
According to reports, she was emotionless the majority of the time, only showing what appeared to be feigned grief at certain moments. She never shed a single tear and kept her eyes to the floor or completely shut for the entirety of the service. Jennifer's oh, father had in fact awoken from his induced coma the day prior and miraculously seemed to remember everything from the night of the incident. What? He would give an official statement in secret on November 16th and multiple parts of his story contradicted what Jennifer had told police. The most significant detail was that she was never tied up, but instead walking around freely and talking with the intruders as if they were friends. He actually spoke with Jennifer over the phone, but was informed by investigators to act amnesic and not to confirm confront her, only to ask her if she thought her ex-boyfriend was behind it. She stated that she was almost certain he wasn't. The only issue with Han's statement was that he had suffered minor brain damage from the gunshot, which could be used by a defense team to refute his testimony in court, or even get it thrown out altogether. Furthermore, it was essentially his word against Hero. Also, you could throw that out on a technicality, but like, what dad would literally make that up about their daughter after they've been fucking shot in the goddamn head? It's like, I lived, and also, now I want to frame my daughter before I fucking die. Like, motherfucker literally said, I saw her vent, dude. I saw her faking tasks. I saw her vent. against Jennifer's, and their turbulent relationship would also work greatly in the defense's favor. York Regional Police knew they needed a confession for the best possible chance at securing a conviction, so they assigned the Chatters who are saying like, oh, oh my god, you idiot, they're saying he has brain damage. What kind of brain damage causes you to literally fucking create a fake narrative, dumbass chatter? Which we have the benefit of hindsight of knowing that it wasn't even a fake narrative, but like, Let's say you don't know. Let's say you don't know, like, no, when you have brain damage, you, you are, are clouded. Your, inner, your, your judgment is clouded, or maybe, like, you got brain damage with a bullet lodged in your brain, so you can't really, you don't have, like, perfect recall. What brain damage goes, oh my god, like, my daughter was walking around freely. Like, at most, the dad would probably just be like, I don't remember any of the events, uh... Frontal lobe damage can change personality. Okay, but changing a personality doesn't mean that you, you're going to fucking concoct an entirely different their most experienced investigator to conduct Jennifer's interrogation. She was called back into the Markham Police Station on the 22nd of November at 2.30 p.m., a week and a half after the incident took place. So just for the record, it is the uh, 22nd of November, 2010. We're at the uh, 5 District Station in the town of Markham. Uh, my computer right now says 2.39 in the afternoon, okay? Uh, just for the record, my name is Detective William Gates. You can just call me Bill here today. And what do you like to be called? Jen. Jen? Yep. What do you prefer, Jen or Jennifer? Jen. Either are? Okay, so Jen, um, you're aware that the um, audio tape and everything's on. Um, it's the same as last time. Okay, you've been here on two other occasions, I understand on the uh, 9th of November, and I believe again on the 11th of November. Is that correct? Okay. And do you know why we're here today? Just to discuss stuff. Yeah, regarding what? Yeah. Dude, I can't believe they literally brought down Bill Gates, the founding father of Microsoft, to do this investigation. It's actually crazy. Just saying. So what happened at my home? Okay. And as a result of that home invasion, um, your father, uh, Han Pan, was actually shot, and your mother, uh, Bika Pan, was actually killed. Is that correct? Yeah, you'll have to speak up a little bit just so I can hear you. Sorry, yes. Okay. 
What's unique about this interrogator is how he immediately adopts a no-nonsense approach, yet manages to build rapport and remain sympathetic at the same time. You'll see that he has far less patience compared to the previous investigator, yet seems to create a stronger connection with the suspect. It's a hard thing to explain, but easily observed as you'll soon find out. Uh, so that's what we're going to discuss here today. Jennifer this time around has read her rights to silence rather than her rights as a witness. If she knew anything about the law in Canada, she would be wise to the fact that she is now a suspect. Fortunately for the investigator, she remains completely naive to the situation throughout the opening phase of the interrogation, making her far more susceptible to the strategy he is about to employ. Okay, just hold on a sec. Okay, we're, we're having technical difficulties here. <laughs> okay, so that's why they interrupted me. What we're going to do is... This is called a technical difficulty technique? Or you... Act like you have a technical difficulty. If you don't mind holding tight there, I'm just going to move my equipment to the other room. Okay, and then I'll come over and we'll move over there next door, okay? I'm just not comfortable being on my own. Okay, I'm going to be right here though. Okay? With respect to interrogations, it's common knowledge that the psychological manipulation begins before a single word is spoken. The physical layout of the room is designed to accelerate the sense of discomfort and isolation, and it's fascinating to observe how each interrogator has their own unique methods of setting the tone. Knowing how this interrogation plays out allows us to realize this detective's procedure. The considerable distance between him and the suspect will keep her relaxed enough to be influenced by phase one, but this same distance will intensify the pressure once he eventually closes it during phase two. You'll notice this detective is slow with his first strategy, but swift with the second. He takes his time in building trust and establishing rapport, yet once this initial connection is secured, the transition to aggression will be abrupt and ever-increasing from that that point forward. Jennifer takes a seat in the room 15 minutes since she was first informed of her rights. It's important to note that she is still free to leave at any time at this point. She is unknowingly a suspect, but not under arrest. So just for the record, this room is being videotaped and audio taped, just like the other one, okay? And I'm just going to grab my chair from across the way, okay? Okay. The detective goes through Jennifer's history of teaching piano and her earlier years of high-level figure skating, which was cut short due to injury. If you didn't get injured, would you still be doing it? Yeah, that's nice. And did you, as far as that, did you do uh, like competition skating or? Okay. And how did you do with that? It was at the top of the pack, but I did the middle average. Yeah, so that's good though. But you did actually enjoy it. It was more than just going for uh, competition. You enjoyed actually doing. I, I pet petrified the competition. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do you have any students right now? Or? No. Okay. And why not? Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because I don't know how to do it. Okay. When I was in grade seven, I stopped taking it, but uh, I still remember swans on the lake. <laughs> How to play that, that's about it. The detective then goes through Jennifer's work history as a server before touching on her future plans in education. Jennifer mentions that she plans to go by her parents' wishes and pursue a career in healthcare, at which point the primary strategy is initiated, the how and why solution. The detective gradually begins to shift the blame away from the suspect and onto another set of circumstances that prompted the suspect to commit the crime. He starts developing a theme that will afford her a psychological justification in doing it. And this theme will be further established as the interrogation progresses. It starts off subtle so that she... They didn't say that this with, this with like the Chris dude. But they kind of did that with him too. But he didn't mention it as the how and why technique when he was talking about the Chris guy. Did he? Did he? Because that's how they got him as well. Where they were like establishing a motive for like a separate... Like an alternative solution, you know what I mean? But I don't think they they called it the how and why solution. Remains oblivious to the agenda. Now, if you could pick any job yourself, I'm not talking about anybody else, but if you could pick for yourself, what would it be? I'm going to be a piano teacher on, like, when I come home. But in the daytime, I'd like to have a a simple, maybe like a lab technician job, just work 
eight, like eight hours a day. God damn it! God damn it! Stop! 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 I've been trying to find a good moment to do a segue. I had such a good one planned, dude. Stop! I've been waiting. I've been stalling since the beginning of 5, 4 p.m. You guys have. You just. Come on! Fucking assholes, dude. How is this any way to consume content? You're just looking at your fucking clock the entire time, waiting for the top of the hour so you can call me out ahead of time. God damn it. A 60 second ad break is coming. You've been spamming for five minutes. I literally thought you would stop. I literally thought you would stop at some point, but no. Ad break, ad break, ad break, ad break, ad break. It's coming, ad break incoming. You, you even had your tomatoes lined up. Top of the fucking hour, dude. It's time for a 60-second ad break. If you no longer want to see the ads, all you need to do is subscribe. Fuck. You broke my fucking frame, dude. Subscribe with a Twitch Prime for free, bitch. Here's the fucking ad break now. God damn it, dude. Literally did not stop. Like, you guys were just straight up. Straight up just fucking spamming it, dude. I'm just gonna start fucking hitting you with ads randomly. I hope you're happy. This is an answer the detective was hoping for. Jennifer's preferred career choice is at odds with what her parents- Because I had such a good one planned for this, dude. I'm not even going to tell you. I had such a good one. Like, I was, like, literally, I was like, this is going to be so good. It's going to be so fucking good. I'm not going to tell you. It's wanted. So he now builds on the concept of the overly controlling parent and the unfair limitations it causes the child. He then links this concept with the subject of Jennifer's boyfriend and how she was kept from seeing him. Now, um... Eventually, you were discussing Daniel. What happened with that relationship? He's doing the exact same thing that the other guys did with Chris when they said your wife is the one who murdered the children, right? Like, and you had to do what you had to do. So that's now the, the motive there is just like, no, it wasn't the ad technique. That one's like kind of good too. I thought about that, but that's cheeky. I have a better one. I'm not going to tell you. Anyway. They didn't agree with me having a boyfriend. Okay. And then uh, once they found out, they didn't like the fact that he was of mixed race. Okay. And uh, it just, they told me to stop seeing him. Okay. And how did that make you feel? That uh, he was the person who just filled an empty void. When you broke up, you felt the part was missing. Is that what you're saying? When, when they first told me to stop seeing him, stop talking to him, I just I felt like a part of me was missing, and I fell into a little bit of depression. Okay. How did they find out? Um, one day when my mother came to pick me up, uh, she saw me with him. He had dropped me off. Okay. He dropped you off. Uh, at Pacific Mall. And my Done. Was Got him. GG, pack okay. it up. And somehow they saw each other, I guess? Oh, my mother saw me. Um, okay, that gave it away. <laughs> what happened next, then? Um, How'd they find who? Um, my mother, at first, was like, you know, bring him home, let us meet him. When I brought him home, um, they didn't, they automatically didn't like him for some reason. Okay. Okay. So you were told to uh, stop seeing him. So what happened then? At first, I stopped for a while. Um, but like I said, I just felt really empty and I felt just depression and uh, okay. I started talking to him again. Jennifer then goes on to explain in further detail how she carried on the relationship in secret and how it became more and more of a struggle hiding it from her parents. Now. How has Daniel taken it when your parents said that uh, you couldn't see him anymore? How did he take it? 
Yeah. Yo, there's some real fucking freaks in the chat who keep saying, well, the parents were really bad. The parents were really bad. Like, you guys really are freaking me out a little bit, okay? I'm gonna need you to dial it back like 11 degrees for saying, like, the parents were really bad. None of that is an excuse to fucking murder your parents, okay? Turning into a murder dirter is not all right. I can't believe I'm doing an SNL joke. Um, and how did you feel? She then goes on to explain that she was living with Daniel at his parents' house for two years, while her own parents thought she was studying at a university. And his parents were, I guess, more liberal than your parents. Their parents, their parents uh, they love, they, they love me. Yeah, okay. And um, Not anymore. they recognized that you loved each other. Jennifer recounts how she bought a fake diploma for $500 to show her parents, and the many other avenues she went down to keep the lie going. She eventually gets to the day she was found out. How did you end up back home, I guess? Uh, they called up my friend, who I said I was staying with in the middle of the night, and uh, she was groggy and forgot what day it was, and so she was like, isn't she home, and I wasn't home. Okay. She messed up. <laughs> I don't blame her, but... No. Okay. Jennifer then goes on to explain the ultimatum she was given, and the restrictive measures that were put in place so that she wouldn't be able to see her boyfriend. So how has that felt, being under those guidelines for the last 18 months? Mm -hmm. It was okay, like, uh, it wasn't the best feeling in the world, because... You know, I just felt like trapped. Okay. But uh, it's what I chose to be with my family. Okay. And so you made a choice between what? Uh, living out on my own with Daniel and staying home with my parents. Did you feel you really had a choice or not? There was no choice because family always comes first. Okay. And where do you get that from? Where do you get that belief? Mm -hmm. So family's number one? Yes. The detective then brings up Jennifer's earlier assertion of being depressed, and then affiliates it with the restrictive measures she was living under. What was the worst the depression got? I cut myself. Okay. And when did that happen? I... Where did you do? Where did you cut? Um, on my wrist and... Chat, stop telling people that she's fidgeting her foot. Now that's all people are going to focus on. Oops. Once people started noticing, I had to hide it other places, but okay. never twice in the same spot. So how many cuts do you have on you? Now, no. Done? Yeah. They've healed? Okay. And did you want to kill yourself? Yes. Jennifer asserts that she tried to kill herself when she was 19 by overdosing on sleeping tablets. She also states that her self-harm was a distractor from the pain and frustrations she was going through. Did you ever feel that they expected too much of you? Didn't he just also, severely abuse her? It doesn't justify murder, but it's more than just bad parenting. Okay. So who would they compare you to? I mean, they had like very fucking high expectations of her. Classmates. Classmates. They were overbearing and annoying. Okay. And so some of them have been successful recently? Okay. And what did they say to you? Wish you could have been that person. Okay. So that's pretty hard, right? Hard to take for you? What I've heard all my life. Nothing. Okay. Did you ever feel like, I know you're smart and they believe you're very smart, but did you ever feel you weren't? I don't know, man. I like, look, I'm, I'm from a different uh, part of the planet from a different time. Okay. I'm, I'm aging myself with this. Like, yeah, their parents were fucking bad, but I don't know enough to, none of it is justifiable, obviously. Like nothing justifies murder, but like chatter saying they're being abusive and whatever. 
one feels kind of sus because you're like literally believing someone's uh word verbatim when that person is like literally a fucking murderer and has been lying about all this shit and this is a liar's testimony and two like even even the way she describes shit like oh her, my parents forced me to do this they forced me to do that like it doesn't feel like um what oh okay that was a good one it, it doesn't feel like it was from my point of view maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm from a different era maybe i'm from fucking uh, a different part of the planet but like they're just doing like typical fucking immigrant parent shit they're being annoying overbearing they're being helicopter parents uh but like i feel like abuse is different You know what I mean? It's still abuse though. Dude, okay, dude. Yes, I know. I know. 14-year-old anarchist in the chat. It's still abuse. Mental abuse is still fucked though. I, I know, but like, what do they do that's like mentally, uh, mental abuse? I, I don't know. Maybe I misunderstood certain parts. Like, what do you guys are, what are you considering like... What are you considering uh, abusive in their actions? Forcing her to live with them under their under their rules when she's over eighteen. That's abuse. Okay, we definitely have different uh, uh, takes on what abuse is, dude. No, we we literally have like. Sorry, I, at first I didn't understand like what you guys were talking about, and now I understand that you're doing that thing where you like literally consider you literally consider everything that is like what the fuck dude what what, what are you guys talking about that <laughs> she wasn't allowed to see her boyfriend could you imagine dealing with something like that yeah i can can you not I mean, I'm thankful my parents weren't like that, but yeah, you think saying like, you think parents being like, you can't live, you can't hang out with your boyfriend. We don't like your boyfriend is abuse. Are you fucking out of your mind, dude? Yo, what is happening right now in my chat? Please explain what's happening in my chat right now. What the fuck is happening, dude? Is this like literally 14 year olds who like unironically try to apply like dialectical materialist values to like the, the, the dynamic, not even dialectical materialists, actually. This sounds like fucking 14 year old anarchists. Like white 14 year old anarchists being like, this is an unjustifiable hierarchy, uh, actually, as a matter of fact. Parenting is authoritarian by nature. And uh, this is a hierarchy that must be abolished, mom. You need to make me my chicken tendies right now, mom. What you're doing currently by uh, not allowing me to eat the chicken tendies is literally abuse. Yo, y'all sound like, I mean, I'm sorry not to like minimize the, uh, disowning your child because you don't like their career choice abuse. Yeah. I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's like serious. Um, and also I don't believe that's serious because she's a fucking murderer. Who's lying in this process, trying to get out of lying about executing a fucking hit out on her parents so what is mental abuse locking her in a fucking room not allowing her to leave like for extended periods of time neglecting yelling saying fucking that she's a loser breaking her down breaking her fucking confidence slowly but surely i don't know just like regular abuse not just fucking uh i don't know not like grounding someone, which is like a normal parent thing to do. Or I don't fucking know, saying your boyfriend's a drug dealer and we kind of don't like that and we will fucking ground you if you keep fucking dating uh, this dude. Normal parent stuff, guys.
Y'all are fucking being crazy right now. What the fuck? All serial killers watching us. Yeah, I got like 50,000 14 year olds waiting. Disowning isn't abusive. No, you if saying like, we're going to disown you if you do this, that can be abusive. I just don't believe that like they said that to her. She's a grown ass woman though. They're so controlling, dude. Oh, interesting. So just say that. Say they're controlling. You're saying they're abusive. Dude, yeah, this is like, this, is this like the Minecraft stand part of the community? Grounding a child is ageist. Imagine if you grounded a grown adult because they used a swear word or something. <laughs> this is a pretty good take. Maybe stay in your own lane on this one. You're trying to explain what abuse is in regards to a woman of color. <laughs> oh, that's so good, dude. That's a good one. Look, this motherfucker goes, move on. Oh, no, that's from earlier. Never mind. I was going to say, trying to avoid the stun lock, participating in the stun lock personally. Grounding me for not doing my homework is literally abuse, dude. Also, it doesn't have to be just physical abuse. You can be mentally abused by your family. For sure. Um, like, there, there, there is a very real psychological trauma and abuse that uh, children are inflicted uh, upon. I mean, or children experience, for sure. I just, uh, I don't know. Seeing, like, what she is describing uh, doesn't fit that metric for me and the areas where like it could fit that metric like uh you know saying we're gonna disown you it just seems like fucking fake bullshit but once again leftist chat very typical of leftist chat to literally behave this way where uh leftist chat is behaving in a way where it's like there is no there is no gray area it's only like it's either you've traumatized me by gaslighting me and fucking emotionally abused me or you're perfectly fine. Like there is no like, oh, they're just fucking bad parents who were also very concerned about the development of their daughter. Like there is no middle ground there. It's literally like everything is just so fucking annoying. Like why? Why is literally everything like cranked up to the fucking nines, Zoomers? Calm the fuck down. Okay? ...as far as what they thought they, that you were. Yeah. Okay, I get that feeling. Yeah. That it's pretty tough to live up to their expectations. Okay, like, your dad ultimately would like to see you be like a doctor. Those were pretty high standards for anybody. Not everybody can be a doctor. Okay? You are white. You can't know what it's like having Asian parents. Look at South Korea. It's brutal. My parents literally pulled me out of a college that I chose to go to because I had two nines both semesters. Like, I'm fucking Turkish idiot. My, you think my parents are fucking understanding when it comes to my grades? What are you talking about? My dad is a fucking PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. My mom is a fucking college professor right now. My dad is a college professor right now. My brother has a fucking graduate degree. Uh, or a master's in uh, in engineering and is a fucking literal rocket scientist at Boeing. And my dad literally tells me every time he sees me that I need to get a fucking MBA. Despite the fact that I make more money than he does. Or did at any point in his life. Don't fucking tell me about like my parents not being strict you dumb fuck. Oh I'm Korean. I know about strict parents. Oh wow. Didn't realize only Koreans were fucking strict parents dude. Didn't realize there was a monopoly of strict parenthood. On the Korean side.
Was I abused because of all that? Fuck no. That's ridiculous. But they may have acted like you could have done it no problem. Their expectations were so high that few people would be able to reach that expectation. I'm not just talking about you, I'm talking about anybody. Um, and it started at a young age. The detective further explores the stresses of living with overly strict parents, and Jennifer explains in further details the way she would cope, which for the most part was lying about her grades and living a double life with her boyfriend. How did it feel having to lie to them all those years? I really felt like I wanted to tell them, but it just, they always looked down in disappointment. Okay. I'm sure there were days when you actually plan that this is the day I'm going to tell them and then you just couldn't spit it out. The opening strategy of the how and why solution has now been executed. A connection has been attained and the desired narrative established. The next phase of the interrogation is about to commence, which is first set up by a two-step strategy. Step one is to induce fatigue. Step two is to induce fear. Now, when's the last time you spoke to your dad? This morning, this day. See if my brother had made it into school. Okay. Okay. And what have you and your father discussed about this case? He just asked me if Daniel was behind it. Okay. And I told him I don't know 100%, but I don't think he did. Okay. Why would he ask that? Because he believes that we still talk and that he would go to anyone to be with me. Okay. And what do you think about that? I know that he's moved on, so I don't think he would. The detective has Jennifer go through the entire incident once more, but unlike the first investigator, offers no reassurance nor consolation. Jennifer starts fake crying again, yet this time is given no tissues to wipe away her non-existent tears. Now, do you think there's any reason why they tied you up and didn't tie your parents up? I'm sorry. One last thing I gotta say is this. Some of you suburban white kids literally deserve to be on a leash okay like like some of you fucking suburban white andies who like fucking call your parents by their first name having asses and and fucking yelling at your fucking dad having asses like are are ridiculous okay and yes you do deserve to be put on a fucking leash when you go to the goddamn mall by your white ass parents oh my fucking lord like literally people are just like not allowing me to play video games after a certain hour is actually a, a, a manifestation of physical abuse. You are neglecting me. It's like, no, they were overbearing parents who were fucking concerned with the well-being of their daughter and were literally overboard and, and overbearing, like I said. But goddamn, dude, like, it's crazy. You call your mom by her first name? You think my mom's first name is Anne, which is mom in Turkish? I've literally never called my mom by her first name in my entire life. This is a hella conservative take, FYI. Yeah, dude. Uh, oh, there you go. You fucking found me, okay? You found it. This is like, I guess this is where I'm conservative, and I literally think that it's the right way to do, uh, go about it. Like... Endless freedom to pursue whatever passion you want to and always build confidence. But like, obviously you can't let fucking kids do whatever the fuck they want lest they turn into dumbasses, okay? God damn, like, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for fucking corporal punishment, but like, you're being ridiculous when you're like, hey, you need to fucking eat your goddamn vegetables before you fucking play Minecraft. And some of you literally are just like, ha ha! That's it. Yeah. Um, does that seem odd to you? Why does it seem odd? Because I was away um, up here separated from the local time. And does it make sense that they would leave a witness behind? If they were going to kill somebody? 
Does that make sense? Yes, I think. Just thinking about it. But it makes sense for somebody that was going to kill somebody to leave a witness behind that could describe them. Does that make common sense for killers? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a mistake they made then? I don't know. They kept saying that they were running out of time. And it just, it doesn't take a long time to kill someone, though, does it? I know. I, I don't know. Jennifer's dramatics intensify as the discussion of the home invasion continues. She's trying to give off the nonverbal cue that she wants to move past the incident. The detective doesn't respond, but continues to go over the different stages of the night in more detail. He jumps from the beginning, to the end, to the middle, back to the end, and then back to the beginning again. None of this is for the purpose of information gathering. He is inducing mental fatigue as to diminish Jennifer's critical thinking. This is often done before a direct confrontation, as it can diminish the suspect ability to consider the long-term consequences of a decision. Jennifer will get stressed and tired, not because she is traumatized by the event being recited, but because it's exhausting keeping up such an act when it's not genuine, and this performance eventually starts to dwindle and becomes gradually less convincing. How did the conversation end with that? I heard my father, my mother calling for my father. Okay. And then what? I have to go through this again. Okay. Uh, um, when you went to bed, was your mom home yet? She had just gotten home and I went down. I told her I'd be right back. And I, I went down, I said hi to her, and, and I went back up to my room. Okay. Were you injured at all during the whole process? Not really. Okay. Not really anything? Step two of the confrontation setup will now commence. The detective employs what is known as the futility technique. He will tell Jennifer that he has an abundance of resources at his disposal and even fabricate much of what he asserts. He's indirectly telling the suspect it is useless to resist due to the overwhelming evidence against her. Now, the reason why I'm here today, okay, is that I'm an expert, okay, in what we call truth verification. I talk to thousands of people, okay? And I basically know when somebody's not being straightforward with me, okay? I can tell by the language they use, how they answer the questions, their body language, how they treat the question, that something's wrong here, okay? This doesn't make sense. The detective then gives Jennifer an eight-minute narrative on police tactics and forensic technology, some of which is embellished, but for the most part true. He then asserts that police are able to use infrared satellite imagery to see the occupants inside a household. By the way, that's literally true. Well, not satellite, but like, uh, that what he's saying is actually fucking true. Uh, they have, uh, uh, what do you call it? it it's not a satellite. It's literally a, a, a van. They use that, yeah. It's not even a joke. They have heat sensors to like, uh, you can you can heat map or like uh, use heat sensors to figure out like what it looks like. I think you can do it from a helicopter too, but uh, I've never heard the fucking satellite. Yeah, they use thermal drones to find weed grows. Yeah. This is entirely false. And basically, if people- <laughs> Because this is entirely false? No, they literally have that. What the fuck? Why did he say that, dude? What the fuck is it called? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Maybe, no, not because this is like uh, in fucking however, what year. He, he rose in 2020. So... It's 
it's not infrared thermal imaging um pretty sure the u.s supreme court ruled it unconstitutional in the united states This guy's asserting that they can look at footage from the fast, the robbery. Oh, that's not fucking true. It's entirely false for this specific case, and it's not done through satellites. But yes, uh, they do have, like, cops do have a uh, uh, fucking, uh, what do you call it? Like, not to embarrass you, but I think you're thinking of GTA 5. Wait, that's crazy. Was I thinking of GTA 5, dude? That's wild that this is like one of many different kinds of equipment that cops have to literally figure out if they, if, if there are people occupying buildings, dude. Like, damn, I guess, I guess I fucking got that from Grand Theft Auto 5, dude. What a wild thing that like, uh, I saw on Grand Theft Auto 5. Radar to cease to wall raises privacy concerns. Use of technology that allows police to see inside homes of suspects has raised privacy concerns. Man, look at that Grand Theft Auto technology, dude. That's crazy that this is techno technological uh, achievements only done in Grand Theft Auto. I already literally said that what that guy was talking about as far as, uh, as, far as a satellite is false. But they do have technology to see inside of a fucking house like this or to... Uh, to, to Figure out how many people are inside. Anyway, let's keep going. People are moving around in a house. Um, it's like an x-ray, okay? And basically we're able to tell, you know, are those movements, are those actions, that number of people consistent with the story that we've been told? Um, are the people in the positions that the witnesses are telling us they were in? Uh, or are they different? Okay, and if they're different, why are they different? Is what what our question becomes, right? And so, at the end of the day, okay, there's so many resources available to me um, that at the end of the day, I'm going to know if a person's telling me the truth or not. The detective is now about to initiate the confrontation, but first brings the entire setup full circle by re-establishing the notions of reasoning and rationale. The suspect is fatigued and scared, but still needs to feel the detective is on her side. Now, I can tell you that nothing surprises me in this job, okay? I am well aware that anybody on this earth is capable of making a mistake. Okay? I don't care who they are. I don't care um, if they're a priest. I don't care if they're a school teacher. I don't care what the situation is. Given a certain set of circumstances, everyone has the capability, Jennifer, of making a mistake, doing the wrong thing. Okay? Um, the key, though, when I talk to people is when they made a mistake, okay, that's one thing, right? The key is to not keep making the same mistake. And to get that information out and get it off your chest. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? So, at the end of the day, from this case, and I can tell you I've spent literally a week on this case going over information after information, accessing all these sources, speaking to every other expert on the case. And at this point, Jennifer, I know that you've not been truthful with the police. Okay? You've not told us everything that you know, purposely. You've spent a considerable amount of time in the last seven years telling half-truths. And I can understand why. Okay, you've had a tough life. What's happened to you, to me, equates to abuse. And all the stresses that you've had and forced to lie, I can understand why you did it. Okay, but you're in another situation here where you're under another tremendous amount of stress. And it doesn't feel good inside, does it? It breaks down the person that you are. Because at the end of the day, you're a good person. I know that. You've got uh, a good heart. Yeah, totally, dude. 
in this case though you've made mistakes yeah like fucking okay. hiring and you're involved. like hiring with your boyfriend a bunch of dudes to come in and murder your family you know just just like some mistakes you've oops you've accidentally stepped into that now involved in this i know that okay there's no question about it the only question right now is are you going to keep making mistakes are you going to go on the route that you've gone on over the years and try to pretend that things happen that never happen? Okay, are you going to not face reality? What do we learn from this chat? The moment that you sit inside of one of these rooms, even as a witness, as soon as the cop is being nice to you, recognize that if the cop is being nice to you, recognize that you're being played. If the cop is being mean to you, recognize that you're a suspect and also therefore being played. So in all instances, lawyer up. I mean, obviously, number one is don't murder your fucking family, you know, but uh, plead the fifth and lawyer up. Don't talk to cops and lawyer up. We know that you're involved. We've done our homework, okay? We have to resolve that now here today. I need to know from you what really happened. And I know why this has happened. You it's have like spent your whole life trying to live up to expectations that you can't meet, okay? And that stress the hell out of you. You're a 24-year-old woman being treated like a 15-year-old, okay? What, you've never done anything that terrible in your life, but you're being treated like you have. You're not being treated like the adult. With peace and love, I'm going to assume Hassan Abi is just manufacturing content by talking real ignorant and privileged instead of unironically making fun of her situation. What? Bro, what the fuck are you? Yo, chatters, sometimes people are fucking wild, okay? They're spoiled, they're entitled. Not every single instance, like, we are looking at edge cases, okay? We're looking at edge cases. We're looking at edge cases in the sense that, one, we're looking at cops being manipulative as fuck, but actually uh, doing it for a, a completely closed, 100% open and shut uh, case, okay? Two, <laughs> we're looking at edge cases uh, when, when, like, this is the indefensible people in the criminal justice system. Okay? Like, there are indefensible people in the criminal justice system. Even, like, prison abolitionists have to agree that there are uh, psychopathic murderers and serial killers and people who do stuff like this that are indefensible and also very difficult to treat. Okay? So not everything has to be a manifestation of traumatic experiences, like... Sometimes people just fucking snap. Sometimes people are spoiled. Sometimes people are narcissistic. Sometimes people have sociopathic behavior that they demonstrate, like literally fucking uh, spending uh, eight years uh, uh, hiding uh, some truths from their parents, which is fine. That's like, uh, that demonstrates that like the parents are very strict, but she obviously took a very different fucking uh, uh, turn there. And then literally organizing a hit squad on their fucking parents. Like, Maybe it makes it so, it makes it easier for you to, uh, maybe it makes it easier for you to just, like, uh, feel like, oh, it's definitely because, like, her parents were abusive, and that's why, like, she, uh, went and, 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 uh, facilitated this, but, like, you're being ridiculous, dude. Like, you're being ridiculous. You are literally talking about a person who is portraying themselves as a victim to a fucking cop right now in the midst of an ongoing investigation Literally a week after she fucking murdered her parents, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you guys, dude? What is wrong with all of you? Well, that you are. Yes, you made some mistakes. Big deal. You're not the first person that has gone out and not told their parents that they're dating a guy because in your culture they don't accept it. I understand that. I've talked to people in here that have kept that secret for their whole life from their parents. Okay, so that's not abnormal, but that puts a lot of stress on you, right? That's not easy for you, is it? No. Now, what we need to get down to here today, Jen, is what really happened. You need to tell me what went on. Because you know who was in that house that night. 
You, you do, Jen. There's no question about that, okay? While remaining empathetic and understanding, the detective still needs to keep Jennifer's confidence low. He watches for denials and stops them immediately. Letting the suspect deny her guilt will only increase confidence and morale. This needs to be stripped away as much as possible, as early as possible. There's no question about it, okay? The focus is kept from the magnitude of the crime and concentrated on the justifications of why someone would commit it. Yes, their intentions might have been good, but they're not realistic. They're not, Dan, were they? Jen? Their expectations weren't realistic, were they? You couldn't live up to them, could you? You tried to. Right? Am I right? And finally, you had to bite back, right? You had no other choice. You felt like you had no other options. You thought of everything else, including killing yourself. This is Canada. We're in the 21st century here. You cannot take everything out of a person. You can have expectations for your kids, but you can't expect them to do everything the way you want. It doesn't feel good to have secrets, does it? No. You have to let me know what happened here, okay? Okay, but you were involved, right? That's the part we need, okay? We need to hear that from you because we know you were. The detective appears to be getting nowhere, so he now lowers the gauge of admission. A confession to a lesser offense is far easier to attain, but once it is attained, can be used to build on the more damnatory elements of the case. You'll also notice that he uses broad terms that infer guilt, yet don't direct- Yeah, the detective should have pulled the other fucking lady's strat and been like, Listen, I understand if you were, like, potentially a victim in this situation, you're a victim to your parents' abuse, you know, like the way that the chat was talking about it. God, your parents were so abusive. And then, uh, you know, turn around and be like, maybe your boyfriend was the one who did this. And, uh, and, and then have her, uh, admit to that. Directly accuse Jennifer of murder. You knew before that night that this was going to happen. I'm going to make that easy on you. That's a true statement, right? You knew before that night that they were coming, right? Jen? It's not worth it anymore. It's hurting you. She seems to be on the cusp of giving some form of admission, yet wants reassurance as to what it means for her own sake. She asks this question nine times throughout this interrogation. It's one of the few things investigators can't actually lie about, as it's been used countless times in the past to get a case thrown out under misdirection. They can avoid the question, yet they can't afford any false promises with respect to sentencing. I need to know the details. I can't even say but I can tell you one thing is that we already know, so you can't change that. I know you did. But it got too far ahead of you, right? You didn't see, you didn't think this far ahead, did you? Jail time, baby. But once they started, once they came in, you couldn't stop it, could you? Good. Could you? Jen? Hmm? I know. Why didn't they stop for you? Hmm? What the fuck are saying? It's not funny. Y'all are crazy. Like you were part of the planning, right? You were crazy. I need to recenter all of you. You have to tell me that part, and then we're going to work through it together. Do you know what I'm saying? You didn't want this. To, you wanted to stop it. You have to prove that to me now. Because at the end of the day, we have to stop this from happening to someone else. Right? Jen, we're going to have to deal with it one step at a time, okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I need to know what you did. And then you and I are going to work through this together. Because the most important part is, of this whole thing is that we do the right thing for your mom, right? 
I am her voice right now. I'm working for your mom. That's my job. And I have to get to the bottom of this for your mom. Appealing to compassion isn't necessarily uncommon when the crime is first-degree murder, yet it can send a mixed message when a justification for the crime was a focus point early on. The detective takes his chance with it, which at first appears to work. Jennifer initially responds in a poignant manner, but you'll soon come to notice that her empathy, alongside her concern, is solely focused on herself. But well, we gotta start... What happened to you? Well, I don't know at this point. Okay, because I don't know what you're going to tell me other than that you were involved, but I need to hear it. What this all was, was a large stiff effort to live your own life, to be your own person, to make your own decisions. Look at all your friends. Look at all the people around you. Does anyone else have a curfew for 9 o'clock at 24 years of age? You had no choice here, Jen, I know that. And anybody else in your situation would have done the exact same thing. The only thing different is I would say that they'd have done it a lot earlier. They would have looked for a way out. When did you first start planning this? When was the final straw? What was the final straw? Because that's what this is all about. Do you want to be a good person here? Jennifer knows exactly what questions to answer and what ones to ignore. Any time a question is non-incriminating, she gives a response. Yet when they are incriminating, she remains silent. She is no doubt feeling the pressure, but still very aware of the situation and the potential ramifications of her words. Okay. And you know when a good person makes a mistake, they have to face that mistake, right? Right? What do you think should happen? I don't know. You're going to prove to people that you know what the right thing to do is. That's what is going to happen. That's what your mom wants right now. She's watching us here. She's wondering, is Jen going to make the right decision here? Is Jen, after all of this, going to come out on top doing the right thing? I'm here for you, Jen. I'm here for your mom. Well, you have to tell, it's one of those situations, you know what, we know that what you did, okay, but you have to be able to explain to me what happened, okay? I can't tell you what's exactly going to happen to you. You just have to be brave here. You have to be brave. Three hours, 20 minutes, and 26 seconds. The exact amount of time it took for Jennifer to display genuine emotion. The investigator would later testify this was the first moment the suspect was being authentic. He allows her to fixate on whatever thought brought this on, and remains completely silent for just under two minutes. Sorry, thank you. Like she's lying. She's literally lying, dude. Like this is a lie, bro. This is literally a fucking lie. And Chad is 100% like saying like, oh, she's abusive, da da da, all this shit. Like that's fucking insane. I, I I'm actually mind blown by the way that uh, the way that the chat's been behaving. Like, and they haven't even realized that I'm stalling because it's top of the hour coming early to you this time around. Running an ad break right now! You fucking sick freaks! There's people who are- who have been literally calling it out 15 minutes in advance. Top of the hour every hour, it's time for a 60 second ad break. I still got a lot of you this time, okay? I gotta fucking switch it up on you. That's abusive by the way, I'm being abusive to you by Switching it up on on where the ad breaks are now, of course 
If you'd like to no longer see the ads, you can subscribe and use a VPN ad block. You can subscribe for free with a motherfucking Twitch Prime. You freaks, dude. You guys are freaks. Some of you are literal freaks. 15 minutes out, people are calling it out. Jesus Christ. Anyway, he's the fucking ad break now. Is Don such a good streamer who makes the ads content? Yeah, we gamify everything here. Yeah, I'm gaslighting you guys. I'm gaslighting you. You realize that now they're going to start spamming early? I know, dude. I know. I know. Well, you know, maybe I'll just never run the ad until later. Why is there someone who keeps saying dream face reveal on twi uh, Twitter? For the record, I have looked into additional details of this while uh, the interrogation was going on. And there are things that... There are things that they've done. His face has been leaked. Oh, Jesus Christ. How the fuck did they successfully dox him? That's crazy. Um... I already ran the ad. Uh, just run the ad and piss you, loser. No, I ran the ad. I'm waiting for it to be done so I can fucking start when the ad break is over, okay? That's why I was fucking stalling. So, because I don't want people who read the ads to... Or who watched the ads to fucking miss the content. It's done. It just ended. Let's go. What? Okay. So you're supposed to take the whole family out? No, just me. What went wrong? The detective now has one foot in the door. It's not an outright confession, but Jennifer has now admitted to planning the home invasion all along. And although she asserts that she was the intended target while her parents were meant to be spared, the information she has now given is enough to place her under arrest. Jennifer is no longer going home after this interview. The detective now presses for more information on the amended storyline. It's essentially step one of day one all over again, but from a more powerful position. He knows she is still lying, and now locks her into as many lies as possible within the new narrative. What happened? Why did it change? Okay, what do you know? How come it was supposed to be you? Because I didn't want to be here anymore. Why not? Because I was a disappointment. Okay, you made some mistakes, but... Nothing that couldn't be corrected. Why was it supposed to be you? I don't think this police officer knows what uh, this person ha has done to uh, people who have abused her. Or who she is uh, pursued as... Uh, who she's perceived as being abusive. I, I don't know. He's, he's making some mistakes right now. To be free from me. Why did it happen this way then? I don't know. Everyone to be free from me. I was disappointed in everything. Okay, but well, why did it have to happen this way? Because when I tried suicide, I failed. What did you want done? <laughs> How? Did it matter? This okay. is a lie, by the way. This is literally so a fucking did you lie. Get to do this then? I don't know who he is. I still his number. Okay, and. What's his number? I don't memorize it. For the record, for those of you who don't know, she murdered them instead of fucking living with her boyfriend, who the parents originally didn't want her to live with because he was selling weed, which is like a fucking weak ass excuse, but like still, I mean, like it's like who gives a shit, right? But the reason why she wanted to murder them is because she calculated that she would win five hundred thousand uh, dollars in in insurance. Uh, so that's the reason. That's the reason why she murdered them instead of just like living with her boyfriend. 
So yeah, motherfucker, keep crying about like, uh, abused, abused, she was abused, that's why she's this way. Literally fucking paid for this. And, and tried numerous times, by the way. Not once. The motive is because she wanted to make $500,000 off of murdering her parents. And also on top of that, I was surprised, motherfucker, this wasn't the first time she tried to execute them with an assassin. This is the second time, and this time it was successful, but only half successful, because she was kind of a failure, okay? Yeah, girl boss, gaslight, slay queen, right, chat? She's also lying currently. She skirts around the questions surrounding her accomplices and gives multiple fake names. Someone she stated that she got the number up. of the supposed <laughs> hitman from an acquaintance named Rick insane? and that she took everything from there over the phone. It becomes apparent she doesn't want to give up or even mention her boyfriend, so for the time being the detective allows her to recount her amended narrative in the manner she pleases. She gets to the moment she instructed the hitman over the phone about her planned suicide. I told him that I wanted to be killed. And did he think that was something crazy? He said, are you sure that's what you want? And I said, yes. Because I don't think many people get that request. Do you? No, but that's what I wanted. And he asked me over and over to be sure I was sure. And I said, I was sure. Okay, so what did you ask him to do then? Come take me out and then leave. Okay. Why did they do it when you were... Um, when your parents were there, then? Never alone. In the nighttime. Okay. So that meeting you had with Rick, you told him what you wanted? No. I just said that I wanted, if he knew anybody who could take care of something that I needed, just that I wanted to be killed. And he said what? He the number. Did he have the number with him that day? Yes. Okay. What did he say he would do? He was just like, come and take care of it. Let me do me. So your specific request to him was what? Come in. Make sure you kill me. So he does come into the house. And you're the obvious only young girl there, right? Yeah. Okay. When he came to your, your room? Yeah. What discussions did you have with the guy that came to your room? The real discussions you had, not what you told us. Where was the money? And I showed him where the money was. Okay. But he obviously said, I'm here to do what you asked. He never said anything like that. What did he say? He just like hands behind your back. Did he discuss ways with you how he would do it? No. Did you request any way for him to do it? To make sure no one else was around. Okay. Why didn't they do it the way you wanted? I don't know. I asked them. I asked them to keep me with my mom when they took them away. Hey, notice how she's still fucking lying, by the way? While she's crying and trying to uh, fucking cry her way out of this situation, she's still lying about what actually took place. Uh, the father already gave a testimony, if you recall, but you probably don't believe him because he was abusive, obviously, some of you. Um recall that uh he literally said that she was walking around this motherfucker literally survived a bullet wound to the head to wake out of a coma just to be like my daughter was walking around and tried to get us executed no the dad didn't die i don't know why people keep saying the dad died it doesn't seem to make sense i know it doesn't make sense to me but is seriously okay for the cop to coerce infer from her? It's just as manipulative as chess sending long message. Oh, fuck you. I don't think it's okay for cops to fucking coerce this much. Especially because, like, we're watching the only successful instances without recognizing the reality that, like, in a lot of instances, this kind of coercive, uh, manipulative inter interrogation behavior, uh, interrogation technique, is straight up used to fucking, uh, to, to get false testimonies all the time. All the fucking time, dude. False confessions all the time. Central Park 5. Specifically, uh, when the, the victims aren't like rich middle class, uh, uh, you know, Asian girls or rich middle class white people. But instead, 
poor ass fucking black kids. Okay, Central Park Five again, reminding you guys that that literally happened. Central Park Five. So it happens to poor white people too. So uh, this channel does have a good video on this, but I just want you to remember that, like, more in more cases, in more cases than not, this is used to get fucking false convictions. This is used to get false testimony. I just want to, again, remind you, because we're literally just looking at the successful instances of edge cases where people like you, where you go, they deserved it. They deserved it because they're like fucking caught dead to goddamn rights. Okay? Okay. Can you sit up for a minute, Jen? Okay, look at me. The detective wants an outright confession and the second direct confrontation is about to commence. Only this time it will be a lot more aggressive, as he doesn't have to worry as much about the suspect locking up or requesting counsel. She is under arrest and going to jail after this interrogation no matter what. Look at me. Okay, what I do believe is that you went to somebody, and I do believe that night you paid them the $2,000. But what's not true is it was never for you. Okay, Jen, no. Okay, you went to this person and you asked them to do a job. And the job was for your parents. You asked them to do this job on your parents, Jen. Okay, let's be truthful. Okay, nobody's going to come there and get the wrong people. If you wanted to kill yourself, Jen, you're not going to pay somebody $2,000 to do it. I couldn't do it myself. Okay, but there's other ways, okay? And if that was going to happen, they could have taken you outside and done it anywhere. It wouldn't matter, would it? If you really wanted to die, all they would have had to do is pull up beside you in a car and shoot you. You made a specific request, and the job was for your mom and dad. Okay, nobody's going to come in there and do the wrong job. Okay, nobody's going to do that. Bro, you can't get a fucking bargain on murder. Okay? You just can't get a bargain on a double homicide. Like, everybody knows this now, especially. Also, the hitman is always a cop. Oh, straight up. They came, you paid, and they did what they were supposed to do. And the plan was for your parents. Me. Okay. Jen, you have to be honest about it. This is the only thing that's in contention here. Okay? You made the mistake, okay? Everybody understands. Everybody in this police department feels sorry for you. I can tell you that right now. Okay? Because they've seen what you're going through. It's so obvious. Okay? that all this tension they put out, basically this is like a volcano, all right? And at one point- Jeez, it was this just is a hitman cop video? Oh my God, we're watching that after. You erupted, okay? And you made a bad decision, okay? And once you hired this guy, there was no turning back. Now in the original story, you said that you hid your cell phone, okay? If it was for you, you wouldn't have hid your cell phone. That would have never happened. So it's in conflict. It's not hidden. It's just, I, I put it there naturally. Okay. It's what I naturally do. Okay. But you Chat, he doesn't understand. Stop saying he see, he understands. He literally is doing this to get a confession out of her. Oh my fucking God, dude. Stop, please. You said on tape that you hit it. There. Chat is like, literally, there's like dudes in the chat who are like, see, he gets it. Like, you're literally getting duped by this fucking cop. Okay? Just like she is. And it's the same chat who was originally saying, like, uh, that she was so stupid for falling for, uh, or, or she was so stupid for fucking, uh, you know, uh, self-reporting and shit. And that they didn't know about it. That's your language, not mine, Jen. All they wanted was so much success out of you, they were not even looking at you as a person. They were looking for a success story. This is extremely Instead manipulative. Instead of just saying... Whatever Jen wants is what's good for us. For the record. Whatever she's happy with. As long as she's happy in her life, 
I'm happy with it. If she wants to work at Eastside Mario's for the rest of her life, that's fine. If she wants to be a piano teacher, that's great. If she wants to continue figure skating, that's wonderful. Why would somebody shoot someone they didn't have to shoot? I don't know. I can't figure that out. And actually not shoot the person they're supposed to shoot. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. Why didn't you tell us this that night then? We were scared. Scared of what? Telling the truth? Yes. But I wanted to die. But okay, but listen. Know. If you wanted to die, you would tell us everything because it wouldn't matter. Jen? If you really wanted to die, you would tell us everything because it doesn't really matter. Right? It does matter because the wrong person got hurt. And my dad is suffering. I appreciate that's what happened in the end, but that's what was supposed to happen. Okay? The good thing about this is your dad did live. And that went against the plan. If you could make this decision over, you would change it. Okay? You would change it. Right? Of course. If I knew who was going to get hurt, of course okay. I would. Jen, you knew who was going to get hurt. That's the whole issue here. Okay, that's the whole issue here. You gave them the plan for your parents, right? That's all I need to hear. No. Jen, you did. No, and this is not going to go anywhere because I wanted them to kill me. Tell me what happened. I told you what happened. Okay, all of it. You did. Okay, all you have to do is here is tell me right now. Dude, he's so horny to get a confession that he's like, he's being super fucking annoying, dude. He's like, I, I, I know it's his job, but like, God damn, dude. Bill, yes, I made a mistake. Bill, yes, I made a mistake. This plan was for my parents. The detective gets no further admission from this point forward, so he leaves Jennifer alone for three minutes to play with her hair before he comes back and charges her with first-degree murder. Okay. I need you to listen close to me, okay, Jen? At this point in the investigation, okay, I'm going to be arresting you for murder, okay? Also attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Do you understand that? Just have to tell me if you understand those charges. Just say yes or no. By the way, we've yeah. only watched like an hour and 27 minutes. She's been there for four hours and 23 minutes at this point. Remember. So what it we're going to do right way, now her, is do you have your own lawyer? No. No? Okay. Do you have a lawyer you would like to speak to that you know of? No. Okay. Would you like to speak to duty counsel? I just want to talk to someone who can help me understand. Okay, so who would that be? I don't know. So do you have a lawyer? He said that you were on my side. You know? okay, I am on your side, Jen. Bro, she what is you... fucking... Yo, she is such a fucking manipulative Andy, dude. She's not fucking, dude, dude. She is scary as fuck, dude. She's scary as fuck. What you like to do? You don't have, I don't have any idea what to do. Do you want me to call duty counsel for you? Okay. Okay. Or is there any other lawyer that you would like? Okay, so at this point, you wish to speak to duty counsel then? Sure. Okay. So what I'm going to have to get you to do is actually empty all your pockets on the table here. I'm going to make sure that they are making a call to duty counsel, and we'll line that up, and you can speak to the duty counsel in private, okay? We've uh, made a call to duty counsel, and we're just waiting for them to call back, okay? Need a drink of water or anything? What's that? Uh, I do have to uh, go ahead and speak to these officers, but I'll come back and speak to you, okay?
He's like, if only I had another two thousand dollars, I get you murdered right now, you fucking son of a bitch. <laughs> He's like, just stay in here, dude. Come on, I have some friends that want to see you. Well, we gotta get, we gotta take care of the lawyers, okay? That's the priority right now, okay? The next time Jennifer would see this detective would be when he testified at her trial. It began on the 14th of March, 2014, and Jennifer pled not guilty to all charges. Her interrogation tape was one of the more damning pieces of evidence put forward by the prosecution. Yet the most damning were the 116 text messages between her and her boyfriend in the six hours leading up to the murder. They thought using burner phones to communicate would cover their tracks, yet forensics were able to uncover the entire discussion just one month after the incident. They spoke in detail about how the crime would be carried out, and it was enough to convict them both, as well as each of the intruders who were linked to the crime via DNA evidence and witness testimony. They were all found guilty of first-degree murder and given a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Jennifer Pan is now 34 years of age. She is currently serving her sentence at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. She will be first eligible for parole in November of 2035. So. Um, the thing I was going to say, uh, here, you spoke over the phone about the murder. Yeah, no, she's the dumbest fuck. So here are some things that I want to mention to you guys. Okay. So first and foremost, uh, I can't find that story now, but I found like a, like a Reddit link to the story where the most heartbreaking part is when the mother pleads with the assailants not to hurt her daughter, not knowing her daughter is the mastermind. Uh, I can't find the actual story, though. The story's not showing up. It's like going to a page not found. Um, but also, the other shit that I wanted to tell you is that there are some things that the parents do that like are way over the top. I would even so go so far as to say abusive, obviously. Um, uh, like, uh, what was it? Like, they, they wouldn't, like, had extremely high expectations of her, uh, all that sort of stuff, made her take piano lessons. That stuff is normal. Normal, like, aggressive parent shit. Um, uh, normal aggressive parent shit, but like, uh, wow, we were right. Chat was right. Uh, none of it justifies what the fuck she did, but also I think she's still a piece of shit. Like I, I, I would say that like, you guys are making it seem as though her murder is directly linked to the parent's behavior. Okay. Her murder is not linked to uh, her, uh, her trying to execute her parents are not directly, are not linked even remotely to her parents, like behavior that you could even fucking remotely consider abusive. Okay. It, it's part of it. It literally is. You are wrong. That's what I'm fucking pissed off about. And guess what? You're going to go back and act like you didn't just say that. It's part of it. It's part of it. It's part of it. She wanted a fucking insurance payout. You dumb motherfuckers. I caught you. You literally got into my fucking trap. I wanted you to get caught in four fucking K to say that her parents' abuse is the reason why, is the reason why their, uh, the parents got fucking murdered. Bitch, guess what? Yeah, you just got sprung, dude. On a motherfucking trap. This is the part that's like, uh, annoying. Karen Keho, Han was seen as a classic tiger dad and bit and Bick was his reluctant accomplice. The pans picked Jennifer up when classes ended each day and monitored her extracurricular activities very closely. They never permitted her to date boys while attending high school or to attend high school dance out of fear that these activities would distract her from her academic commitments. Jennifer was not permitted to attend. If you consider this to be even remotely like that, that is like at the border of abusive behavior. Okay. Cause that is over the top, but not even fucking remotely remotely uh is something that you could fucking turn around and say is uh is part of the reason why she became a fucking murderer okay jennifer was not permitted to attend any parties during her time and her parents believed that she was attending university that's bad parenting that's bad parenting that is bad fucking parenting okay not every instance of bad parenting is literally fucking emotional or physical abuse. Now, 
at the age of 22, she'd gone to a cl never gone to a club, never been drunk, visited a friend's cottage, or gone on vacation without her family. Jennifer and her friends reportedly regarded this upbringing as restrictive and greatly oppressive. Despite her parents' high expectations, Jennifer received good grades in lower school, da 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 Okay? Now explain to me, explain to me why her parents being over the top and overcorrective and overzealous led to her wanting to murder them for insurance money. Explain that to me, motherfucker. And trying twice to murder them. Not once, but twice to murder them. Bitch, that's my upbringing. My parents are still alive, though. <laughs> 